Welcome to Lawyer of the Week. Lawyer of the Week is creating a global community of lawyers, solicitors, and their support to inform and to encourage each other. My name is Pamela Deneuve, and I help focus and successful lawyers to move their practice to the next level and to achieve their peak performance. This week, we have a peak performer who's sharing their story. Please join us. We hope that you enjoy it. Hi, my name is Pamela Deneuve, and welcome to Lawyer of the Week. Today, I'm very pleased to introduce you to Ed, Edward Andrew. And let me tell you a little bit about Edward. Edward is a serial entrepreneur, former English barrister and business consultant, and a career life trainer. Ed has founded businesses in Australia, the UK, India, and Indonesia. He is a podcaster and does online training, seminars, and workshops to help people manage and align their career and life. Ed currently lives in Sydney, Australia. Hello, Ed. How are you today? Hey, Pamela. Can I speak now? Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having me on your show, Pamela. I'm very glad uh, that you're here. And how's the weather there uh, where you are? Well, I'm looking out the window now at my country club, as I said, <laughs> as I said and it's a, it's a beautiful day. It'll be uh, in the sort of uh, in the low 80s, I think, today. So all is good. Wonderful. I'm glad to hear that. Well, I'm going to ask you the Lawyer of the Week questions. And my first question is, when and what made you decide to become a lawyer? Actually, you were a barrister. And what um, made you decide to leave law? Well, the first one is pretty simple. Um, <clears throat> I suppose my parents would say I was always fairly argumentative <laughs> as, as a child, um, but I always liked debate. And um, I think from a very early age, actually from about 15 or 16, I wanted to study law, but I particularly wanted to be a barrister. And in England, a barrister is really the equivalent of a U.S. trial attorney. We do most of the, um, the, 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 the court work, but also the sort of analogy is, uh, probably not the same now, but it's a bit like a, a GP and a specialist. So when you go to the doctor, you go and see your, your physician. And if there's something seriously wrong, he sends you to a specialist. The barrister is sort of like the specialist. Whereas the solicitor is rather like the, to, sort of like the GP. It's probably not a great analogy now. And I'm sure some people will be very unhappy with that. But that's sort of the way that the profession mm -hmm. had um had evolved. So I always wanted to do that. Um, and I particularly wanted to go to the bar because I wanted, I was passionate about justice. And I saw that, you know, standing up in court and arguing a case, regardless of for who it was for, was something that I was passionate about doing. So that's why I went. Um, why did I leave? Uh, I went to the bar at a time when um, we do an apprenticeship called a pupillage, and pupillages are unfunded. So the first six months of your working life, you're unable to earn any money. You're actually not allowed to earn money. And the second sixth, you earn very little. Mm -hmm. um, and it generally takes a long time to get going. And what I really wanted to study or, or practice was two areas of law which interested me. One was public international law, which is disputes between governments and, um, and border disputes or governments and, and private uh, companies um, or intergovernmental disputes. And the other was um, what is now called... Um, uh, alternative dispute resolution or mediation. But in those days, and we're talking 25 years ago, there were very little opportunity to do that type of work. And I saw many of my friends in their corporate lives buying their first apartment, buying their first car, moving on. And, you know, 25% of my fees were getting written off because no one paid them. And, you know, you're, you're, you're scrapping around. And I thought, I, I want to be the very, very best in life at what I do. And I can't do that at the bar. So I decided to leave. Oh, interesting. And, and, and I had never considered doing anything else with them. I thought I would be like Lord Denning and retire at 92. You know, I, mm -hmm. I'd never anticipated that I would do anything else. So that was a big change to step outside of law and find something else to do. Oh, boy, that took a lot of courage and uh, risk taking to do that, I'm sure. I think it just, it, all I had to do was look at my bank account. <laughs> <laughs> But also, I, I, and, and <laughs> that's partially true, but I also felt that 
I was really passionate about about justice, and I saw a lot of, uh, say, what we would call Friday justice in the courts, where a trial would be coming to end, and the lawyers wanted to go home, the judge wanted to go home, the jury wanted to go home, and you never necessarily got the right result because people, other things were impacting on the sense of justice. And I felt that also some of the barristers that I was working with just had lost their edge and lost their passion, and and it no longer resonated. So I, I, I loved it, mm-hmm. but it didn't give me that sort of, um, that awe that I'd had before. So it was time to move on. Okay. All right. Well, um, that sounds really interesting. Uh, can you describe some of the obstacles that you had to overcome to become successful, especially as a, as you call a serial entrepreneur? Um, two words that my wife doesn't like at all. <laughs> she thinks there's too much ego attached to entrepreneur, but possibly. I always used to call myself a business owner rather than an entrepreneur, but it seems to be the, 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 the thing to do these days. Um, like obstacles are many, you know, they, they hit you every single day of your life as an entrepreneur. I think, um, uh, and, and to put this into perspective, I did something which many people would never consider doing. I, I left England. I had my first business meeting in my first company the day after 9-11 oh. with sitting in. So I'd bought an apartment in, in the center of London on the Friday to cater to the U.S. tourist market coming into Knightsbridge. And then 9-11 happened a few days oh. later. And the day afterwards, I had my first meeting at nine o'clock in the morning with the global head of HR of Freshfields, the global magic, law, magic circle law firm in London. No planes were flying over London because there'd been a ban. Um, Mm -hmm. And we had this very surreal discussion as to, is everybody alive? Yeah. And and fortunately for for that particular business, they were okay. Their their employees survived. But, you know, if you think about the struggles that people and businesses go through, I don't think there has been another such cataclysmic day Mm -hmm. in history or in recent history Mm -hmm. um, to be starting a new business Mm -hmm. and and I then got on a plane and went to Sydney where I knew one person (laughs) to a new country and created what was uh, which became a very very successful business but you have to have incredible self-belief in your ability to do that mm-hmm. and to hustle and to be robust. And, and I think it's a certain mindset required to do that. And, and I think that mindset, when I reflect back on all the businesses I've built, some brilliant and some others not over the years, I think that that mindset is both productive and counterproductive. Because if you have this innate inherent belief in your ability to do anything, sometimes it doesn't go well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. You have to understand when to back off and back down and go down a different path. Right. Well, now you had international businesses all over. Uh, was there, is there somewhere that you enjoyed um, being, uh, having a business more or that was more uh, exciting or challenging? Um, I think, uh, look, the, the first business, I had clients in over 36 locations around the world. We did a lot of work in the States, mainly in, uh, in New York and, and a little bit in Washington, a little bit in LA. Mm-hmm. And that's like, uh, my grandparents are American, so I love being in the States. Um, mm-hmm. They're from Philly. Mm-hmm. But um, the two countries which I have loved doing business in the most is in, I had a business in Delhi in India. Uh-huh. And and that was a, a legal services business, a, a head owning business. I love that country. It's got so much vitality, so much energy, and there's such an enormous willingness to, to just to get out and get something done. Mm-hmm. It has many different challenges as well. Mm-hmm. But, and, and in the fashion and e-commerce business, we also did a lot of our production and manufacturing in India. So it's a country I love. Um, mm-hmm. It's got a special place in my heart. Uh, it is challenging. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, the other country I spent a long time in, well, uh, relatively, was um, Indonesia in Bali. I lived in Bali for a year and a half running our fashion e-commerce business and mm-hmm. and bringing our children up in an entirely different culture, which is with Hindus and Muslims and Christians and Buddhists and seeing how they all work together mm-hmm. uh, in a country which um, obviously English is not the, the first language. Mm-hmm. Um, 
was, was and it was a beautiful experience uh, and i mm-hmm. and i think that was great fun mm-hmm. and a, a complete sense of freedom i should also say that i'm very very grateful to having been able to come to Australia and now I'm a, an Australian citizen as well. And it's been a very good country. And a, again, a country like America full of freedom mm-hmm. to express mm-hmm. yourself and to explore. Um, the, the greatest challenges probably existed in doing business in Indonesia. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because um, from a legal perspective, there are many challenges in the way that they, particularly if you're in an import export business, um, they change the rules on in customs mm-hmm. pretty much whenever mm-hmm. they choose to. Mm. And so you can have goods impounded. And when you're running a, uh, an import export business, you can't afford to have anything sitting on a dock or being confiscated, which does right. Right. happen. Right. Um, and so you have to be very uh, street aware as mm-hmm. to how you operate a business or mm-hmm. um, how you go about engaging with the local community because the the visa that I was on there allowed me to to go and conduct business Mm -hmm. but not allowed to work and so you know the work was in Australia um but but going to see factories our factories every day seeing how uh you know textiles are made how they're printed how they're put together to me being a a lawyer is incredibly creative so Uh (laughs) (laughs) Uh, and and that's one of the things I'm, I'm also passionate about is that I think lawyers are inherently very creative people, but mm-hmm. through the, the, the world of legal, formal legal education, mm-hmm. um, that creativity is suppressed very quickly simply because it's not, it has never been a skill which has been highly valued by law firms. Right. Whereas right. now with design thinking and creative thinking and mm-hmm. critical thinking, uh, uh, everyone realizes that actually these are skills which we really need in our businesses. Absolutely. Now, um, we encourage uh, peak performance and uh, for you to have had so many uh, different uh, business ventures, what would you say is your secret to uh, peak performance? I'm not sure if I even know. (laughs) (laughs) I think um, peak, let let me, let me um, put it in the context of peak performance, meaning, how do we optimize our day, shall we yeah. say? Mm-hmm. So, so what I found is that I'm someone who needs a routine. Mm-hmm. So what I do now is slightly different to what I used to do. But what I do now is that uh, before I do anything in the day, even before, you know, uh, I get the kids up or with my wife, and, but before, I've, before I turn my phone on or engage with any work, I go and do a short series of affirmations, mantras, and meditation, Mm -hmm. which grounds me for my day before I get into the reactive state of dealing with work. So Mm -hmm. that's the first. So so routine is very important. I also particularly then would exercise pretty much every day, very rigorously. Mm -hmm. And it was, it it was a question of understanding your stress levels. Mm -hmm. Meditation helps with that enormously. Yeah. Um, being physically, so very important to be, very, to be physically active and mm-hmm. healthy, to have a good balanced diet, not to drink a lot of alcohol. And I know these things people think, well, you know, this is just, you know, it's crazy stuff. We know this already. But to be a peak performer, you need to be very well hydrated. You need to be physically fit and you need to be mentally fit as well mm-hmm. and, and be in good health. If those things are aligned, and you also need to understand that um, being very successful at work, earning lots of money, mm-hmm. and going home and being unhappy is not peak performance. Right. Right. <laughs> you might think it's peak performance because you are performing in an office environment where everyone thinks you're a leader. Mm-hmm. But if you are not happy with your lot outside of work, or that work is the only thing that keeps you going from day to day, you are not performing at your peak. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, in my, uh, in my view anyway. <laughs> okay. Well, that's what we're asking for your view. So Ed, what do you, advice would you give anyone who's struggling or facing difficulties reaching their goals? Well, you know, that's what I teach Pamela. So we could do this for about, I've got about six hours of lectures on it. Okay. <laughs> I think the first thing to do is to identify what is the reason why you're struggling. And I think many people don't have a good idea as to why they think they're struggling, but actually when they break it down um, and decode it, it's something entirely different. So 
you know, if you are, to, to, to give an example, if you are struggling in your job and, you know, there is a degree of dislike for that or distaste or, you know, you're not getting promoted, you have to work out, first of all, is it the job? Is it my industry? Is it my career? Or is it me? The chances are it's going to be all of them. Mm -hmm. It's um, even if it's a case of being repetitively passed over for promotion and you wonder, you know, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to me? I've got the skill sets. Uh, the, the, the two bits of advice I would give there, and we'll make it very specific, is one, you have to work out um, if you're getting an appraisal, does the appraisal tell you okay. these are the skills you need to be promoted? Okay. Mm -hmm. If you have, is your boss or your workforce able to provide those skills that you need to do? Are they going to pay for you to learn those skills? Are they going to support you in that environment? Mm -hmm. If they are, mm -hmm. and they do that, and you've learned those skills, and you still got not don't get promoted, you're entitled to ask, of course, why not? I've done everything you've asked to get promoted, and you still, you're not putting me up. Yeah. If they cannot answer that question for you reasonably, mm -hmm. and they're still holding a carrot, you have a choice to say, thank you very much. I will take my skills somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and that's a very important part of it is your choice. Mm -hmm. If you're not getting, if you're getting passed over promotion because your boss uh, is threatened by you and intimidated by you, they're not going to tell you that generally, mm -hmm. but it's something you're going to be aware of. Again, if you have all the skills that are necessary and it's not happening, go and talk to someone else in the organization, find someone who's a supporter of you, work out why it's not happening, mm -hmm. have a dialogue, have a very open, honest conversation. I think employees are f afraid of having open dialogue with their employees, but they're paying you to do a job. You are giving your time and service to somebody else, right? right, right. You can leave. Mm -hmm. That is your choice. Now there's a whole, that opens up a whole, a, a different set of um, fears, but we'll take one at a time. So work out what, what the problem is, is you don't like the industry, you don't like the job, you don't like your boss, or is it me? Is it the fact that I've never asked for that promotion or when I've been told, go and learn these skills. I'm afraid to say, how do I do that? Or can you pay for that? Or maybe I'm not good enough to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's fine. If that's the reason as well, we can help you get over those obstacles as well. So first of all, find out mm -hmm. what's the underlying cause of that malaise or unhappiness. Mm -hmm. Is it something that's going on in your personal life? Mm -hmm. If you're taking that into work with you, because you can't separate work and your private life, it's impossible to do that. And then when you do, it causes more trouble. So w work out the reason for that. And always know there is someone out there to support you. So create a supportive, safe environment for you to go through a process of transformation, which enables you to come out the other side. Find a coach, find a mentor, find someone you trust who will help you. And don't expect to do it overnight. When you change your default patterns, it takes, according to University College London, at least 66 days. Some people it might take 20, some people it might take a year. Mm -hmm. But you've got to, the first thing you've got to do is take action. You've got to make the first step and say, I want to change. Because yeah. you're the only person who will allow that change to happen. That's really interesting. Um, so you mentioned about that you have uh, courses, online courses. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I'm just finalizing writing them, Pamela. <laughs> so, but yeah. so the first course is, uh, is called, at the moment, it's called the Abundant Career and Life System. And what it enables people to do is address exactly the question that you just asked, which is, it doesn't matter whether you are at a crossroads in your professional life as to, you know, do I want to go and do something for myself? Do I still enjoy mm -hmm. my life? Or actually, I'm very unhappy at work. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know what to do. I'm being treated poorly. Or it may just be that actually I, I do enjoy my work, but I want to do something else. I realize that there's, there's a higher purpose to my life and understanding what actually that means. And the, the, the course, that first course is my signature course. And that takes 25 years of my business experience operating yes. around the world. Yes. It takes six years, the last six years of my life, really understanding, getting to understand human behavior, psychology, and neuroscience, why we do these things. And, mm -hmm. and one of the, fundamental reasons why I went and did that is a because I was curious but b I when I was 42 so six years ago I got prostate cancer mm -hmm. uh, an early diagnosis by fluke and I got rid of out of my body and I had to deal with that and mentally that's very challenging for a absolutely, man absolutely. particularly a young you know, a reasonably young man so I had to go and learn about myself 
how do I deal with this? How do I change my mindset? How do I change my patterns? How do I live a life full of gratitude and compassion and empathy so that when things happen, you don't react or you react in a way which is, is much more calm. And we don't try not to judge. You try not to have any expectations of people. You understand what perception means Mm -hmm. so that you never put your, you don't, Trying to put yourself in someone else's shoes is very difficult because how they think and feel is going to be very different. It's rather like if you went on a date mm-hmm. and you had an expectation on that date that uh, you know, you'd have a lovely evening and the person you're on the date with would ask you for a second date and you may have some romance and the other person just wants to have fun and have a great dinner. Mm-hmm. So it's un- it would be the perception the expectation is that something's going to happen, but the other person doesn't know that. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. It's a very simple explanation. But also your perception, you may say, well, how could they possibly feel like that when I feel like this? Well, because that's how they feel and that's their right. feelings. That's how they're entitled to feel. The only way you can understand it is to communicate with each other. Sure, absolutely. So, so that's the course goes into all of the skills that we need to learn to mm-hmm. develop Mm-hmm. greater emotional intelligence and and one of the core skills is um so the things we do is journaling mm-hmm. affirmation visualizations mm-hmm. but also the core skills are around preparing yourself to face any challenges mm-hmm. um and to really understand who you are mm-hmm. and what you want and how you have the complete power to go and change that for yourself that's wonderful well ed what kind of legacy do you want to leave um it, you 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 have a very rich history, uh, and so how do you want to pull all that together and uh, have a legacy for your, your a legacy is a, a, a really interesting one, Pamela, because I'm not sure I'm a great believer in legacy. Okay, <laughs> okay. well that's good. I'd like to hear about that. In in the sense that um, there's a favorite quote I have, which is a quote of the Dalai Lama, mm-hmm. and it says. Um, the primary purpose in life is to help others. And if you mm-hmm. can't help them, don't hurt them. Mm-hmm. That is really, I think, would be my legacy is to take Wonderful. all of my teachings and say to the world, look, we're here for a finite period of time. Yeah. Go and help people. Find whatever your mission is in life and your passions mm-hmm. and your purpose. Mm-hmm. Try and help other people and try and leave our mm-hmm. planet in a better place. If we wow. can do that, every we get progress. And yes. so, so that's what I see by legacy. I don't need statues of me or people to write books as to what I've done and haven't done. If my teachings remain, that's great. But when I'm gone, I'm dust. Right? So I... <laughs> I can only, I mean, yes, you can make an impact when you're no longer here, as many people have done, particularly artists and philosophers. Yeah. And so maybe that's a legacy, but I don't, I don't need a legacy, if you see what I mean. Yes, I do. I do. Absolutely. Well, um, on the, our final uh, Lawyer of the Week question, which we ask every, every one of our guests, is name one or two things that you do to relieve stress. Oh, well, there you go. The first one I've talked about is meditation. Mm -hmm. Um, So when I feel that I'm in a place which is not great, or Mm -hmm. I'm getting a little bit sort of anxious or antsy or frustrated, then I know that my body is vibrating. You can feel Mm -hmm. it. You you know, the steam begins to build up. And I go and sit and I meditate. And sometimes I'll do that for an hour and a half. I just, and that really, uh, that really grounds me. Or I just use simple deep breathing exercises Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and also uh, not do the monkey, the monkey brain, but just say to myself, you know, this is just, just let this go. So try to be um, equin, is it equinanimous, which is allow things to come and go without them reacting to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Look, we we can't get through life. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> life, life throws us things <laughs> curveballs like me being 10 minutes late because the clocks have changed this morning and trying to get ready for it <laughs> I, I can't go and meditate on that because i'll completely miss the, <laughs> the podcast <laughs> where is ed he's over there meditating for an he's hour in, and a half yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry pam and i'm just going to meditate on that one so I'm, I'm nice and calm when i come into it but i also listen to meditations pretty much every night um and just things which are peaceful. I don't watch TV. Yeah. I rarely watch any news feeds at all. I might go onto CNN and BBC to see what's going around the world, but I don't allow the outside world into my world. Good for you. Good for you. Well, I try not you. to anyway. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I can see your Zen, your Zen face, you know. <laughs> well, I'm looking at this beautiful <laughs> scenario. Good. So I'm looking at this glorious <laughs> golf course and lake at the moment. So, and the sun's out, so it'd be quite hard not to. Well, I'm sure some people may not be Zen out, but, but right. it, it, it's pretty good. <laughs> very good, very good. Well, Edward, I'm so glad that you made time in your busy schedule. I know you've got, you're coming up with a course. That's going to be out soon. And, uh, you know, perhaps we can, uh, you know, coordinate our, the publishing with when it comes out. Perhaps that would be a great Fantastic. idea. That would be brilliant. That's very yes. kind. Well, Pamela, you know, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. I love talking to you. Um, thank, you. thank you so much for having me on your podcast. And as you know, if there's anything I, I can ever do for you, just ask. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for joining Lawyer of the Week. As always, I encourage and support each one of you to achieve your own peak performance, move your law practice to the next level, and create your own legacy. I love to read your comments about how you achieve peak performance in your law practice below.